Good evening. <laughs> uh, I'm Dinty W. Moore, Director of Creative Writing here at Ohio University. Uh, our speaker reader uh, this evening is, is co-sponsored by the Department of Creative Writing and the food theme uh, of Ohio University. I want to put a special thank you out to Anna Claybone, who was indispensable in helping to pull this event off and get everyone and everything lined up at the same time. Um, we're extremely fortunate tonight to hear from Sherry Flick. Uh, she's both a food writer and a fiction writer. Sherry's food writing has been published in the Wall Street Journal, Plowshares, Pittsburgh Quarterly, the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and many other magazines and anthologies. She is also author of the novel Reconsidering Happiness, and most recently of this collection of masterfully brief and precise short stories whiskey, et cetera, for sale at the door on your way out or wander back now, because um, my introduction isn't worth it. Anyway, uh, Sherry is one of the master chefs of flash fiction, of succinct but power-packed, realistic, Carver-esque stories that artfully reveal the hidden dimensions of human beings and how we stumble through our lives and loves. She captures her characters in a single slant detail or often in an unsettling bit of dialogue or through the rituals and customs of how we cook, how we eat, how we live. She's also the master of the sentence. Anyone here, no matter what you write, nonfiction, fiction, poetry, business memos, can learn from her ability to be so very, very concise, yet still pack a wallop, many wallops, across every paragraph and every page. If you've ever had a tense family dinner Listen to Sherry's opening sentence here from her story, titled simply, Family Dinner. I'm the squash soup, chopped up and muddled glowing orange here on the sofa. The soup itself bubbles for real on the stove, but I'm angry, so it's simmering seems like a gaping mouth. The soup froths, me on the stove. I suspect that dinner didn't go well. You didn't come here to hear me, you came to hear Sherry Flick, but before I turn this over to her, I want to tell you three things you probably don't know about tonight's visiting writer. One, Sherry was founder and host of the coolest reading series that, ever, that I've ever attended. Actually, I just found out it's still going on occasionally, so I shouldn't use the past tense. She is founder and host of the coolest reading series I've ever attended in Pittsburgh on Gist Street in a reclaimed commercial building at Junk Yard that resembled a Western Pennsylvania distressed brick globe theater. Just about every writer I know, including Patrick O'Keefe, who's here somewhere, uh, passed through Pittsburgh and ended up at Gist Street, on stage, in the audience, or both. And there was always food, pie, cookouts, during the height of the summer, vegetable giveaways. Two, Sherry is keeper of my favorite garden in the world. If you know Pittsburgh at all, think of the steep hills that stretch up south the Monongahela River, the South Side Slopes, the stacks and stacks of houses once home to steel workers. That's where Sherry lives. Her backyard is thin, long, and runs straight uphill, 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 and it is filled with plants and food and beauty. Three, and finally, in putting together her new book, Whiskey, Etc., for sale in the back, Sherry put great effort into finding the exact right order for the many flash stories contained within. Here, in her own words from a recent interview, is how she found the perfect balance. I spent a great deal of time reading the full manuscript aloud to my dog, Bubby. <laughs> Sherry Flick. My dog, Bubby, is very well read at this point. Thanks for coming out tonight. This uh, space is wonderful. Um, and thanks, of course, to Anna and Dinty. Anna took me all around town today and to all the places that she's worked. And I got to eat food at them, so that was great. Um, so the poster reads food, whiskey, no, stories, whiskey, and food. But I'm going to read stories, food, and whiskey. So I'm going to change the order just a little bit. And it's going to start with stories. Um, 
There are 57 stories in this collection, and most of them are under 1,000 words, and some are very, very small. Um, and I like to start with this story, Pie Inside. It's kind of like an appetizer story. And I'll show you. It's very short. It's just this little tiny paragraph. Pie Inside. Margaret was angry again. Bob could hear her banging pots and pans, slamming cupboards the way she did when she wasn't in a forgiving mood. He snuck out back, went for a long walk up in the hills. The clouds converged and then rolled away, dark and dramatic like an opera. Bob crept along until the first tiny star peered down at him, suspicious. By the time he got home, the place was silent. Bob stood on the front porch. The automatic light clicked on, a spotlight. His show was about to begin, but he'd forgotten his lines. Through the window, he could see the pie inside on the table, not an effort of love, but a grudging nudge toward it. He could see the pie. He opened the door, tiptoed in. So I, uh, the newer stories in this book, and the, the stories in this book kind of span my entire career, because it takes a really long time to get 57 stories that you like. You know? So um, the earliest story is, was first, um, published in 1990, and then a lot of the stories, of course, are, are, were recently written. Um, and some of the, most, the more recent stories, I've been very interested in place and writing setting and starting with setting and having character and everything rise from that. And that was new to me, where I'd almost always started with character, you know, or started with a detail or an object. Um, so there are several stories in here that kind of um, really show the, those kinds of um, setting exercises I was doing to write. And uh, this is called Horizon. Bugs skittling, just out of the corner of Randy's eye, and then gone when she looks. The green throw rug stretches toward the fridge, a tiny pink dog ball parked at its center. Stacks of padded envelopes, a muddy yellow, scatter across the table. The radio babbles on and on. A coffee cup, a thermos, a cell phone, an acorn squash. The cap from the milk bottle beside a nearly empty bottle of wine Court. The stairs make a steep arrow up and out and away. A bug skittles again, then it's gone. The radio only gets reception after 9 a.m. The airwaves are invisible, like the bugs along her broken floor. It would be better if a fire raged in the stove. After all, it's cold, and Randy is trying to decipher the world. The gray sun, the low wind, the traffic humming out on the road past her window. Randy had taken the canoe out earlier, out on the lake with the dangerous water, out there pushing through the sloshing waves, and in a blink, she remembered her sister and a guardrail and the car. She didn't see that part, though. Randy hadn't been there. She just remembers herself into it. Today, Randy banked the canoe and walked along the shore, the brisk wind circling her ears, the lake, waves rolling, seagulls, fried fish, good times, her sister, Rosalind, nodding off, sliding into the guardrail. Randy's head fills. To distract herself, she makes a list of decent lovers. She thinks of parties with laughing and drinking and cowboys and bars. The places and people she glided through those years in which she tried to swallow down the memory, the guardrail. Now the world hoards together her things and brings her here to sit in her kitchen. A creek upstairs means nothing, just the house settling again. Randy deposited the canoe snug in the shed, cleaned the sink, replaced the candle nubs, split a stack of wood. Now the dog quietly snores beside her. No whining, no barking, just the cat batting the pink ball. The sound of insects crunching in her floorboards. There used to be hostels and foreign countries, cracked espresso cups and trains rumbling through the night. Randy never seemed to know anything, even after reading the guidebooks. She never understood why they had to look at so many churches. Rosalind had understood that. She'd read things twice. Rosalind pulled in knowledge like Randy's bong hits, smiling sheepishly as she pulled up dates from memory, named the flying buttresses. Randy remembers this. 
a train rumbling through the countryside, a lover wanting to hoard her in, the seats black and yellow like a bumblebee. She hugged the bearded guy there in those seats while Rosalind sat alone near the front of the car. Once the train stopped, they walked over rugged ground and through a cemetery. They ditched Rosalind, fooled around by a ragged river. Randy remembers feeling a kind of rusty disappointment. She snuck into Rosalind's room after it was done, drunk, darkness, sleep. The next day, Randy and Rosalind left, heading in one direction, alone, shooting off like a crooked arrow into the dusty air, everything scratchy and blurred. Randy's throat sore and her nerves pulled tight. She just remembers wanting it to be clear, wondering why it couldn't be clear. The answer, why couldn't she just be in love? Rosalind said it was never that simple. The train, its whistle, the station, dim and cold, the wool pants, the mustard yellow scarf wrapped high on her face, young then, unlike now, young with skin that glistened like porcelain, Rosalind with eyes so clear, eyes that could see so far, even then. And that night, with the car, Randy should have been there, of course. Rosalind driving home alone while she finished up some business, while she had a talk with one or another of the guys. The guardrail rising up like an arm extended for a hug. It curved around the car. Rosalind had strapped the canoe to the roof after they were done at the shore, finished with their day of fun. She had her hands at 10 and 2 on the wheel. Back at the shore, Randy had asked for one more kiss for old time's sake as Rosalind's head went through the windshield again and again. Um, that's one of the happier stories in the book. No, I'm kidding. No. <laughs> um, there is this kind of strange um, theme in the book that I can't, still can't quite explain. Um, I had written a, a lot of stories and I was looking back through them and there were so many canoes. You can't imagine how many canoes I wrote about. And I was like, we have kayaks, we don't even have canoes. You know, there was all this like this canoe and a shed. Um, it was something I was working out. Those objects were, were meaningful for me in a way. That, um, so there's a whole section in the book called Cars and Canoes because I had enough to kind of, you know, shape them into the book. Um, and so, yeah, so for more uh, canoe stories, you know. You can read yourself. Uh, the um, third and, and last story I'm going to read from the short story collection um, is called Sweet Thang. And uh, it comes from a, a series of exercises, kind of failed exercises I was doing for a while in the mornings where um, I had on the local community radio station and the deal I made with myself is whatever song came on the radio while I was writing, I had to incorporate that song into the story, which like, it was a complete failure except for two, I got two stories out of it. I probably tried to write about, I don't know, 10 of them, 15 maybe. Um, so this, uh, this comes from one of those exercises and um, you can get bonus points if you know the song. Sweet thing. I am a sweet thing. That's what the song on the radio keeps repeating. Sweet thing, sweet thing, sweet thing. And with the sun trickling in, All of it was come to an end. I wait in the foyer. It strikes me as odd that I must have a foyer. In fact, it strikes me as odd that I must have a foyer. I never thought it would come to this, of course. But I wait here, slumped a bit against the wall, looking at the dwindling light and how it plays off from here. The house is quiet, only the radio babbling and dull pop music. Death looks frazzled when he giggles in through the front door. The lock has always stuck. His black hair, still black after all these years, looks flush, and he looks good in a suit. Always has. He barges into his own home and stops short when he sees me, slouched as I am against the wall. He stops short when I'm in the room. Here is where I pull up the gun and shoot him. The version of that is. In this version, I sigh. 
He looks up, expectantly, looks behind him, as if this might not be what he's looking We need to talk about this. He composes himself. It's like a rematerialization on the spot when he puts himself together. Oh, I don't think that's necessary, he says. After all, you've done so much talking. Isn't it time to do the rest? He sticks a leg out, taps his shoe, walking with him. I have cleaned your house. She's cleaned my house, I say. I have bundled myself as a sweet thing all morning and afternoon. I have moved furniture that I've not moved out into the living room, all into one place. You can see it, you don't want to see it. I have used the key you keep hidden in the flower pot for your new lover. So unimaginative with your hiding head. She can make me. She can make me. What was that last part, he asked? Um, Nothing, just look at me right inside. My eyes are bearing him to read into it as he always read into what I said when we were together in those 20 years. I dare him to be beautiful. I don't know the rat next to it, in case you wondered. My anger has boundaries. I did go to the shooting range once, and I will admit a certain pleasure when that fanning pop. When I hit the target, when I hit the target at the time. Are you? He sidles up to me now. Are you threatening me? He hunches down as if he gives sporting advice to a child. His fingers stiff on the floor, about to mark about to out the play and action. Because if you're threatening me, he says, I can also talk about being target sweet thing. I can talk about being shooting. I smile then, swiping at the hair that limits my vision, keeping my sights so close. I can smell him, that aftershave musky thing that always set my heart down. It doesn't go away, does it? It being certain compulsive behaviors. For fun, I ask if this is the moment we have that makeup sex we never seem to have when we're married. He snorts, I don't think we're there to do the case. Let's go look and see what we've left the skills from each other. It's civil, this time. We've walked with each other so long, it's comfortable by some way. Things your friend, I say. He stops mid stride. Why would you do that? Crushed him, I say. You know, I felt a kind of lightness today. I mean, I raged for so long, and when I started reading my stuff, to centralize it, as it were, I just thought, wow, this place could use a good scrubbing. And I don't know, I felt a kind of pity for you and your kind. I did, honestly. So I scrubbed the fridge. He switches his course, and I can hear the soft suction of opening and closing. I hear a tap a tank. He walks back down the hallway carrying two micro boots. He has a little earnest freedom to him. So lovely that I remember for the last time, the first time I saw him, walking across the lawn and Susie speaking his barbecue, walking so fluidly like he could be, would be, a man in love with his Short. Uh, now I'm going to switch to um, food, and um, it's funny that I didn't mention the part of the end of the discussion, um, because I'm going to read this essay that um, was in Hofshares, and they have, Hofshares has a series that they do called Plan B Essays, and they ask writers um, what they would be if they weren't a writer for their other career. And, uh, and so I decided I would be a performer. I wasn't a performer. Um, then I started thinking about gardening a lot, and, uh, and I came up with this essay, uh, which is called Caretaker, Murderer, Undertaker. Dirt runs the ridges under my fingernails, making crusty silver moon. I, I try to clean up before I go out, but once I'm settled at the restaurant, I look at my hands and start to pick at the crud. I notice the smear of green on my calf, a smudge of yellow on my skirt. I tuck a hem under my thigh. What is that? I don't know, but I know where it came from. When people who don't garden think of gardens, I imagine that they imagine straight lines, tidy vegetables, and reasonable, reliable I see them seeing a steady, predictable rate of cultivation that leads to their lunch, dinner, and future steps. But this isn't how far they're starting. 
When I close my eyes and think about my garden, I inhale a glorious jungle of earth and raw and chaos. I see baskets of tomatoes, bushels of green beans. I exhale and inhale. In my garden, things reseed, forage, cilantro, dill. They do this here and there in convenient and inconvenient places. They also do it unpredictably from year to year. There are multiple planted patches of carrots, broccoli, kale, and Swiss chard. Too many tomato plants stake and strapped to the fence. Volunteer butternut squash vines, creek pea, arugula, perennial flowers, lot of lilies, and irises, echinacea, and black eyed seasons pop up each season in the middle of the vegetables and herbs. Blackberries leap and hang themselves into the tiger lilies into the table. There are some straight rows, yes, but that is not the point. What is the point? I'm not sure that it's something instinctual, some kind of primal drive to fill and create and make and flourish and then, well, kill and eat all that stuff. A gardener is caretaker, murderer, and undertaker. We work toward death. On our way to harvest, we drown bugs and chase groundhogs. We grow rocks. We actually grow rocks. We make elaborate deer collectors of outer spring soap with tin hands and human hair, and then we put everything to rest. Hearing my neighbors shoot funny, we then, honestly, I'm relieved. Bunnies are too cute for me. The bunnies went every time in my garden, but not in my neighbors and the bad of them. I remember the first time I actually learned to strangle a deer with my bare hands. It had daintily consumed all of my heart to grow, heartbreakingly beautiful, lay yellow, heart shaped heroin tomatoes right off the vine, leaving just the vine, vibrant, green, and edible. Even the baby deer, I would have strangled it. I'm a vegetarian. You need to understand these garden impulses are impulses that pulse outside of my ethics. In my real life, I type on a computer, I listen to VR, I cook a lot, <laughs> and I play the lele game by Ryan and Patton, so I read books, I scrabble, I say pretty clean. I wear lipstick when I get dressed up, I don't touch spiders, I squeal when I see a snake or a mouse, I don't believe in the death penalty or animal cruelty or guns. But still, I want to destroy that which destroys my kingdom. This past year, I let carrot for the seed and giant flowering and be like blooms. These tendrils look aquatic out there as they bobbed and died on the chicken wire fence, so uncared for. I couldn't bear to pull it up, grew and grew, and now it become next year's carrots. We can come on the show. I am a god here, but I'm not religious either. Gardening has created me a kind of fevered unleashing and opening up. I kill the bugs that try to kill my vegetables, and then I kill the vegetables too. Or I had a redo, if I had one of those chances to change that you sometimes read about. A lawyer becomes a baker, an accountant becomes a rock star. I would become a farmer. It would change me totally. In the garden, as I work, big bumblebees and skinny honeybees hung beside me. In a frenzy, they cook every single bloom in sight. They are ecstatic over the sunflowers this year. They are, I am certain, ODing on the sunflowers. I've never seen anything like it, except maybe at that one party in New Hampshire in 1989. And then it's a gloriously sunny midsummer day. Spears of sunlight seep down through the sorghum leaves as I thin the leaves. That's when I see the spider. I mean, it's a giant. She has housed herself in Brussels sprouts tent in a elaborate home like web. I learned later that she's a water weaver. Right now, she is furry and mighty and waving her many arms at me as if to say, Get out. Filling an ounce of shudder with a zero squeal, I say to myself, Good. That's good. She's good. A good guy. Me, a good guy. And I keep working. Saying with the giant robotic face to Frank Mantis. Saying with the thin black snake. Slithering under the raspberry bushes. Good guys. I reach for a tomato and my thumb plunges into the splotchy moldy view that covers its underside. I wipe my hand on my shorts. Later inside, my hands are coated in yellow pollen, so the garden has gilded me, changed my skin into pollen rusted sandpaper. Tiny bullet to gold eggs make a tiny triangle on the back of my zucchini. 
days. I regularly drown eggs. I smush and scan until I feel feral. Bowls of beer drown the slugs. We call the bowls slug parties. We do. Sometimes when I come inside, sweaty and dazed, I look at myself in the mirror, and for a moment, I don't know who I am. My eyes have become electric blue, and I am so alive with dirt and light that I glow. I know if I were a farmer, and not just this urban gardener on a slightly larger scale, I would be. I would have to grow cows and chickens, and how, and how would they eventually be so different from the vegetables I kill on a daily basis? How would wringing one of their necks be different? From twisting a hair of corn from its stalk. Some days my hands tingle with this knowledge, the power of cultivation, the power of knowing life and death. Bam, I smash a cucumber beetle against the wooden post. Snip, I get that cabbage mop before it flips away. I transport the ladybug gently, carefully, with beans, and I drown thousands upon thousands of stink bugs in soapy water each morning. The dew glistens on the grass, and my little Yorkie runs to bark at our next door neighbor again. The bee balm and chamomile sway in the breeze, and the rotted hummingbird takes a big interest in the bomb's bright red petals. Darting, darting, traffic from downtown Pittsburgh's commuter zips and unzips on the parkway down the hill. They inch along like ants on my peony buds. The crickets kick in, sounding like tiny car alarms. Typing this essay in my nice clean living room, I feel a little itchy. I do feel bad some days for all of this, because I do. In general, I'm a kind and generous person. But just today, I saw a troop of tiny stink bugs on my scarlet rubber beans, and I said out loud, Get the fuck away from my beans. <laughs> I harvest the vegetables and I make delicious fresh meals and hand go to my husband. Friends. I compost what is left over after the prep. Those leftovers break down and rot in the big black container in my yard until they aren't recognizable. Until they pass over to become nutritious dirt, healthy, beautiful compost that I spread across the bed as I get ready for the next growing season. Always cycling everything around in a big, heaving, wriggling, and warm filled circle with the friends in the to me. I think the essay is about killing. I think it's about killing. Like that's what I'm getting to with my gardening. Essentially, we don't think about organic gardening because uh, like instead of using the chemicals, right? We just so it's, it's kind of funny. It's not like anything gets to live more. It's just that we do it. <laughs> Thinking about that was like, yeah. Um. So the last thing I'll read is um. It's about this. And uh, it, it's a, an essay I wrote for the Wall Street Journal. And it's part of a series called Message in a Bottle. And uh, what the Food and Drinks editor does is um, she picks a, a creator, it's always a creator writer, she picks a writer and she has a bottle of booze. And she emails the writer and says, Do you want to write this piece? And it's the Wall Street Journal series. So like, just say yes to me. And, um, and she's okay, you have five days to write the essay. It's 1,300 words as soon as you get the bottle down. And so I said, um, what is the bottle you're giving me? And she said, it's um, Kibikaye whiskey. And I said, can you give it to me today? And she said, I can. And so uh, she brought it over and handed it to me. And um, I decided I would do the way I wrote the essay is I would take this very expensive bottle of whiskey from the small batch distillery and plop it into my monthly food night over we drink like mainly like, food. Just plop it in and see what happens. Uh, so here's what came from that. Uh, I did not write the title. The title is What Was He Pairs Best for? <laughs> It's a beautiful spring morning in western Pennsylvania. The flowering trees, wedding peonies, a whiff of lilac drifting up the hill. The sky rings blue, the big puffy clouds ride by outside my kitchen window. My to-do list has 300, 300 items, but when my editor asked if I'd like to drink whiskey in 
write about it for the Wall Street Journal, I figured I could definitely add that to the list. After I learned the whiskey was named Yuki Kaye, I asked if she could get it to me by Saturday because I knew I was heading to our monthly food. That's short for Hoot Nanny. At the Hoot, we play and sing old country tunes, two three chord songs, almost exclusively. Yuki Kaye has a cowboy in the front riding a bucking bronco. The bottle is thick and pop with the suggestion of vintage. It almost goes without saying that hooting and drinking go together like Kiki Kaye and Ruth, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I don't tell my fellow musicians I'll be writing about this whiskey. I just mention I'm bringing a poppy soup cake and a bottle. Eric makes a vegetarian cowboy chili and synchronicity of the Bob will rip Eric and I sit around the table eating. Chili. It's 7.30 p.m. when I pour sipping shots. High West website tells me Yukai is a blend of straight bar whiskeys that things sweet and makes good men happens. My crew sips and nods. Good quality, it says. Nice enough feel, it says. They're messing with me, of course. <laughs> Bob sets down his glass and says, Fighty and smoothie. Not. This is more refined whiskey than our food is accustomed to. It's aged in Syrah and vermouth barrels. It comes from Utah Mountain Country in the award-winning High West Distillery. We moved to the living room to tune up and play. My husband Rick is in charge of cocktails. He has carted up supplies from our home bar to make Manhattan's a shaker, the Ipikaye, two vermouths, three kinds of bitters, and bada bing cherries. I brought along some homemade juice. Rick gets a work call that will send him away for a couple hours, but the first he shakes up Manhattan's we play a few songs. James Alley Blues, followed by Kicking Down the Palette, and Carl Perkins' Shirt, shirt Fall. The Manhattans are deep burgundy, and we toast to friends, to this beautiful day, and to Eric's getting tenure in the first Eric plays banjo and guitar in a real band, but when he hoots, he plays his cello and bass. Bob plays rhythm guitar and sings, Bill plays the guitar and harmonica, Rick plays a tenor youth and sings, and I sing and play a banjo youth. He's a ukulele guitar. Megan, usually present but not tonight, plays fiddle. Sometimes David shows up with a snare drum, or Patty with her mandolin, or Chris with another guitar. These nights save me soul. With Rick absent, but we briefly at a loss, we finished our Manhattans. Eric has declared them a dangerous fruit. <laughs> and it's true. Yippee Kaye tips these Manhattans towards magical, slight sweetness. We're serving up these in tumblers because this is a hoot, and this is a cowboy whiskey, and it seems wrong to serve them in actual Manhattan classes. Eric volunteers himself as bartender. I ask him his how to make a Manhattan. He says, how hard can it be? And who can argue with a mechanical engineer who's just fine for tenure? When he comes back with the shaker, it does look the right color. He pours and he play Remember Me and Lucinda Williams Jackson. Bob, a shot in the beer guy, drinks yingling with his Manhattan. A Manhattan with a beer bag. Who's to say it's wrong? Especially when you're hooting in someone's living room and having a fine night of getting acquainted with this fancy whiskey. When we assure Bob we expect him to drink beer with his cocktail, he says, Why, thank you. I feel so nurtured. No. I completely screw up in this road of Rock and Rocky. I can't remember my part at all, even when we start over. It's clearly time for poppy seed cake and round three. Rick's youth saves his chair in a tight circle we form. I volunteer to make the next batch. I ask Eric what he did. He says, two shots of whiskey and then twice as much of that bottle as the others and some bitters. Sounds good. I make mine with the lavender rosemary bitters. I shake and taste while they play while the circle be unbroken. We all agree that Yuki Kaye is so good it works in any Manhattan you might care. Rick returns and he looks worried when we tell him we commandeered the bartending. What did you put in them? He asks. Eric admits to adding some of my ginger syrup to his batch. Rick reclaims the shaker and makes the final round of the perfect Yippee Kai house. 
bottle is empty, he yells from the kitchen, when we're all ready to learn the new strings far away. We play the big guitar and his dog song, keep on Sunnyside, and Halo, a truly messed up version of Muhammad's radio, radio, Three Quarters Gone to Stay, Long Black Veil, Sea Soul, and Original. Lonesome Whistle, Waltz Across te Texas, Love's Blues, another Swept away in a great Kitty Wells red holy tune. It's midnight. I've been live texting the evening to my editor. She's no longer awake, but I continue updating her, fearing I won't remember details tomorrow. My final text heads out around 1 a.m. We finished the hippie kaya. Bullet bourbon is uncorked. They're saying that they pay five dollars more for the fancy whiskey. Now they're talking about the hangover after. And we're playing one of those. Drinking the bullet after the Yippie Kaye is like stepping out from under a Sierra Madre waterfall into a little Kentucky Creek. That isn't to say that I don't like both of those experiences, but back to back, well, it's time to sing Goodnight Irene all night. Thank Do you have 
No, but then what is it? Do you have a lot of parents on this? Or is it always kind of Yeah, that's a good question. I had a lot of fun writing those things, right? I really did completely live chats the night to my editor. <laughs> and he took videos, like, we were getting drunk by, you know, I'm just taking all these videos and I'm sending them to her, and then taking, like, texting notes, so I would read them And it was just, like, this really fun night, and then writing it, I was able to kind of keep that air of, of fine play. So there are definitely some, some writing that's more like play, and some, it's more, um, to go deeper, you know, and think way more about travel and exposure. I like I like all of this, but whiskey and sometimes you don't. Things kind of like how we find home and 
how they're replicated in culture. And um, so that was really interesting. But um, now there's actually more published and written about food and social media. But I wrote that um, three years ago. And at that point, I couldn't find anything published that talked directly about Instagram. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of what made me kind of think about it. My interesting. <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, so that was that was um, an interesting challenge. Of kind of more, not what I was going to do, right? Just so along with that, I think um, maybe now we're in some great places. So maybe that goes along with the pattern. Like when people are like, oh, actually, I need something homemade. Yeah, they yeah, have, you know, and then they capture it. And it's, you know, it's like not, I don't know, um, like, you know, we don't make a lot of homemade stuff anymore. As a culture, you know, we do a lot of people in this do, but. Yeah, and it's the idea, too, of, um, you know, the images are also beautiful, right? You think of the still like painting, it's not, um, the composition is beautiful. And so, so it's, it, there is, so in the um, piece that I wrote, the um, designer, these wonderful images that kind of show the history of this kind of composed food images. Uh, as, as a culture, we, we do think of citizens in the Instagram images aren't the same. So that was really interesting. So feel free to post as many of the pictures that you can get out there. So we're just making them out of all the time. I was trying to find some of my own images. <laughs> Thank you so much.